We're going to honor our first responders at the end of the, end of the uh, message today, and I'm looking forward to that, and we're so grateful for our first responders, and we'll talk more about that later. I do hope that you'll continue to pray for the family of Officer Preston, the HPD officer who was killed in line of duty this week, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the service. Let me remind you of where we've been. Perhaps you've not been here in this time and you're just now coming back, or maybe you're a guest today. We've been looking at cultural issues, so look on the screen with me. We'll just see where we've been the last few weeks. We've been in a series called This Is Us, or This Is U.S., and the first week we talked about the battle for truth. And let me just say before we look at the rest of them, everything hinges on this battle, the battle for truth. Is this God's word? Is this God's truth? And we established that it is back in week one of this series. But everything stands or falls on the truth of God's word. And then we talked about the battle for life and death. And then the battle for sexuality. And then we looked at the battle for marriage. And then the battle for the church. There you go, I'm getting ahead of the guys, and then the battle for religious liberty. And we looked at those, all of them with God's Word and God's truth in mind. And, and I had a direction I was going this week. In fact, in one of the services I even mentioned last week, uh, some ideas and thoughts I was going to head toward. But during the week, uh, I started to say, I call an audible. I think God called an audible in my heart. And as I began to look around and think and talk to people and see what's going on in our culture and maybe my own heart as well. Um, I was just drawn to another direction. And, and bef before we go there and before I talk about that direction, I want to talk about and make sure we understand who our real enemy is in the battle that's going on for this culture we've been talking about. Because I think we get confused about the real enemy. With all that's going on, I don't know about you, but I can watch TV and I can get pretty fired up. Can you? And you start listening to the things being said and all the garbage that's out there. And sometimes we begin to look the wrong direction and we look at the wrong people thinking they're our enemy. And that's not our enemy. James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James says, resist the devil. And just saying that, and we don't preach about the devil real often. I've been preaching here about 12 years, and I can probably count on one hand, certainly on two, the number of times I've preached about Satan. And by the way, I'm not preaching about Satan today. But I do want to remind you of who our enemy is before I get to what I want to say. Because I think we've all been deceived by some things. There are three possibilities about this one scripture refers to as the devil. One possibility is he's a fictitious character. That is just a, this, this image that we see of a guy in a red suit with horns, the one that Saturday Night Live has made fun of for so many years, the one that comedians make fun of and joke about. So he's, one possibility is he's a fictitious character. A second possibility is that there's this dualism in the world and there's this good and evil and there's always been this good and evil and there's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Satan and there's two e equal opposite kingdoms of good and evil going at each other. And then there's the biblical view of the devil and of Satan. Now, the truth is a whole lot of people, maybe even most people now in our culture, laugh at the thought that there's a real one, a real person, if you will, that's called Satan or the devil. See, see, we've become too sophisticated. We've become too educated. We've become too wise to believe in such a creature. By the way, he is a creature. He was created. We've become too uppity, if you will, to believe in such a creature. We just know too much. If that's your view today, let me just, let me help you just for a second. I doubt that there's anyone in this room that's more educated that's wiser, that has more stuff from a secular perspective as far as education and thought process ability than C.S. Lewis. There might be, but I doubt it. Here's what C.S. Lewis said about the devil. He said there are two, and this is paraphrased, but it's almost identical to his quote. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, meaning the human race, two equal and opposite errors into which the human race can fall about the devil. One is to disbelieve in his ex existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in him. 
So he, what C.S. Lewis says is this brilliant mind, C.S. Lewis, and if you've never read C.S. Lewis, go read him. But he says the one error we can make is to believe that Satan, the devil, does not exist. And the other is to give him too much attention, pay too much attention to him, and have an unhealthy interest in him. Both of those are a problem. Uh, the reason you should believe in this real person called the devil is there, let me give you three reasons quickly. First of all, the authority of the Bible. Countless places the Bible talks about him. First Chronicles 21, one example. Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Not only that, the testimony of Jesus. You go read in Matthew 4 of the wilderness temptations where Jesus was tempted by Satan. And, and by the way, more than 25 other times in Scripture, Jesus refers to him. So to say you believe in Jesus, but don't believe in a real being called the devil or Satan is inconsistent. You can't say, I believe in Jesus, but don't believe in the one Jesus refers to. The third reason is the New Testament, the validation of the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians 11 says, but I'm, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And so there's all kinds of reasons we should believe that Satan is real. Now, with that said, let me just make two points about him quickly so I can, because I'm going to transition to the thing I want to talk about today. You'll understand why when I get there, why I'm setting it up this way. But the first thing about Satan is he is a powerful enemy. He's a powerful enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. John 8, 44, He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, we see his nature and his methods. You know the story, Satan comes to, the serpent comes to Eve, Satan comes to Eve, and then Genesis 3, and he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, I left out the very first part of that verse, but the first part of that verse begins that the serpent was more crafty than any other creature. That, that word crafty means he's, he's shrewd, Satan uses his shrewd knowledge to deceive us. In Ephesians 6, it says to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. That means his craftiness, his deceit. Uh, and the definition there means against his cunning devices. So Satan uses cunning devices to deceive us. And in that verse I read you about Eve, he comes to Eve with this cunning device and he weaves in a little bit of truth with a little bit of error and deceives Eve, and you know the consequence of what happens there. He, he uses this cleverly devised question to deceive her. Derek Kidner says that he smuggles in the assumption, listen to this, he smuggles in the assumption that God's Word is subject to our judgment. That's what he did to Eve with that question in the garden. And when we buy into the lie that this book is subject to our judgment, we are headed in the wrong direction. We're playing in his territory then, and we're in trouble. And God does not give us the option of saying this book is subject to our judgment. This is God's truth. So he is a powerful enemy. But the other side of the coin is he's a defeated enemy. And that's really good news. He's a defeated enemy. Listen, his power is limited. 1 John 4, 4, you are from God, little children, and have, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's just the truth. James 4, 7, I read it a moment ago. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Why is he a defeated enemy? Listen, here's why. Colossians 2, 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities... He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. So Jesus, by the cross, triumphed over these powers and authorities. He disarmed them on the cross. That's the picture. Now, with that as our background, I want to read you a fictitious story. It's a made-up story, but it sets the stage for what I think is a huge issue in our culture today for many of us in this room right now with all this going on. 
So get the picture. You got the picture. You know who our enemy is. It's not some person. We have an enemy, and he is a powerful enemy, but he is a defeated enemy, but he's an enemy who is still at work to deceive us and use his cunning devices against us today. And I want to point one of those out to you. Here's the fictitious story. Once upon a time, the devil decided to have a huge yard sale. He advertised that he was selling off many of his tools. On the day of the sale, a curious crowd gathered, but they soon discovered that one tool had a big not-for-sale sign attached to it. One man got up his courage and approached the devil. He asked him to explain what that tool did and why it wasn't for sale. The devil answered, I can do without my other tools, but not this one. It is the most useful tool that I have. It is called discouragement. And with it, I can find my way into the hearts that would otherwise be unreachable. Listen to that sentence again. It is called discouragement, and with it I can find my way into hearts that would otherwise be unreachable. When I get this tool into a person's heart, it opens the way for me to put anything else in there that I want. Satan has a cunning device. And I think it's being used today on many, many, many of us. It's a device called discouragement. And discouragement opens the door for anger and bitterness and worry and fear and perhaps for many of us today, even hatred. We're all susceptible to it because we live in a broken world and in spite of the fact that he's defeated, he is still a cunning adversary and we're susceptible to. If you think you're above discouragement, let me point out some real heroes in the Bible that dealt with discouragement. Job was an incredible godly man. And you know all about his losses, but Scripture says that in spite of all that he lost, with his children and his health and all those things, that he still did not sin with his lips. But his three friends showed up, and they, and they were there with him in mourning. And in chapter 3, it says that Job became so discouraged that he wished he had never been born. The prophet Jeremiah became so discouraged, he cursed the very day of his birth. Many of David's psalms are reflections of a man dealing with discouragement and despair. And by the way, though, he gives us the answer to that because a lot of those same passages talk about hope, the hope that we have. After the people of Nineveh repented, Jonah said, God, I knew this is what you were going to do. And then in chapter 4, he said, Lord, take my life. It's better for me to die than to live. I'd say he was a little discouraged. You got Moses in Numbers chapter 11, and he couldn't handle all the people. And Moses finally comes to the place where he says, God, if you're going to treat me like this, just go ahead and take me out now. I've had enough. Godly heroes of the Bible face discouragement. The best example, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I do want to unpack it a little bit, but I think the best example of a godly man that faced discouragement that helps us understand it is Elijah. I love the story of Elijah. His life is, 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 is just so compelling. There's so many wonderful stories about him. Let me just kind of walk through his life just for a second so I can get to discouragement. In 1 Kings, if you look at his life, first of all, remember God sent him and he went and confronted King Ahab. And he told Ahab, it's not going to rain except by my word in all these days. And that's what happened. This incredible drought came. He said, now it's not going to rain. There's not going to be any dew. And there was this incredible drought. And God told him to go hide himself by the brook Cherith. And so he went to by the brook Cherith. And there God provided water for him from the brook. And remember, God fed him with the ravens. And he was there this whole time being cared for by God. And then the brook dried up. And he said to Elijah, and by the way, notice all the way through, Elijah just obeys God. He is a powerful man of God. And he obeys God. And he goes to this woman. He, this woman is Zarephath. And God provides for them. Remember, she has just a little bit of flour left and a little bit of oil. But during all this drought, it never ran out as she provided for him and for herself and her son. And then God said, Elijah, I want you to go to Ahab now and tell him it's going to rain. And God goes to Ahab, who's been looking for him and wants to kill him. And Elijah goes to him, confronts him, and they agree to this confrontation on Mount Carmel where the 450 prophets of Baal will be there to do battle against Elijah, Elijah's God, and this confrontation. 
It's where Elijah says to the people, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people were silent. And then the contest begins. Now picture this. Here's this man of God, pretty much alone. And these 450 false prophets of Baal, who Ahab and his wife Jezebel worship, if you will. And Elijah says to them, I tell you what, guys, let's do this. You build your altar, and you sacrifice a bull, and you put it on the altar, and you call for your gods to come and consume your sacrifice. And I'll prepare an altar, and I, I'll put a bull on the altar, and I'll call for my God to come and consume the sacrifice with fire. And whichever God answers by fire, he is the real God. And they said, great, contest is on. He said, okay, you guys go first. And you know the story. They sacrifice the bull. They prepare the altar. They put the bull on the altar. And they began to cry out to their gods, and they cried out all morning and all into the noon, and <laughs> nothing happens. They're cutting themselves, and Elijah begins to mock them, 450 of them. And here's Elijah alone mocking these false prophets of Baal. Shout louder. Maybe your God's asleep. <laughs> I love this. Maybe he's on a trip. Oh, maybe he's gone to the bathroom. I mean, can you picture this? And nothing. And finally, later in the afternoon, step aside, boys. And he repaired the altar of God, put the 12 stones around it, put the sacrifice on it, poured, took four jars, large jars, and poured water all over the wood three times, so 12 jars, covering it, wetting it down completely. The trench is full of water. And he prayed. He said, let it be known that you are our God. I am your servant, have done all this at your word. Answer that your people will know that you're God in turning their heart back again. And fire fell, fell from heaven and consumed everything, just consumed the whole place, all around the altar. And the people yelled, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Incredible victory. And they killed the prophets of Baal, and there was a great victory on Mount Carmel that day. And then he told Ahab, get ready because it's going to rain. The rain's going to come. And he went up and prayed seven times on Mount Carmel. And the rain was to come. And Ahab rode his chariot back to Jezreel, but God empowered Elijah. And he outran him and ran back faster than his chariot all the way back to Jezreel. What an incredible victory. He has this incredible victory. And his whole life has been walking with God and victorious with God. Isn't that, isn't that an incredible picture? But I want you to look how fast discouragement came to this man of God's life. 1 Kings 19. So Ahab goes back to Jezreel. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then, sent Jeze then Jezebel sent a word to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. So Jezebel, married to the king, says, Elijah, same thing's going to happen to you that happened to my prophets by this time tomorrow. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba. And then he went another day's journey and sat under a juniper tree and asked God if he could die. Look at the verse on the screen. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. <laughs> How'd that happen? I mean, here's this incredible man of God, a great victory. Really a string of great victories, but this incredible victory on Mount Carmel. And now he's discouraged and just saying, God, go ahead and take my life now. Because some woman said, I'm going to kill you. There's a lot of principles here, a lot of truths here. Let me just point a couple out. After the highest peaks often come the greatest valleys. That's not new. You've heard that before. But I think he had false expectations of what the results of Mount Carmel would bring, and because those false expectations were not met, he became discouraged. If you follow the story, he became physically and emotionally exhausted. He, bottom line, this is it. He took his eyes off the God he worshiped and served his whole life. He put his eyes on Jezebel, who made this threat that she was going to kill him. Couldn't God handle this if he'd done all those other things in Elijah's life? He, Great, great victories, and just that quick. Now he's discouraged. And if you follow the story out, it, it gets even better. I'm going to stop there for the day. 
we've been experiencing all kind of stuff in our life. 2020 has been a crazy year for all of us, hasn't it? I, I saw a meme, I want you to look at it, that helps us understand how crazy 2020 has been. Look at this meme. Marty, believe me, you don't want to go to 2020. <laughs> if you don't get that, that's from Back to the Future and the Time Machine and just, never mind. <laughs> but it's true. We, all these cultural battles we face, all the postmodernism we've been talking about, all the stuff about there is no truth, and we believe that absolutely, I guess. The craziness of the things being said, and we've talked about these these last few weeks of, well, that's his truth or that's her truth. Looking like our country's coming apart at the seams. Seeing the deceitfulness of media and everything. Who, do you, who can you believe in this culture anymore? And we see all that, and it's all so discouraging. It is, isn't it? And, and I think about, and I know this is the day we're honoring our first responders, I think particularly right now about our law enforcement officers and all the garbage that's been said about them these last few months. How in the world do they keep from becoming discouraged with what's being said about them? And, and I will tell you, and, and for those who are honoring today, we see you and we love you and appreciate you. And, We, we want you to know how grateful we are, and we sure don't want you to be discouraged because we know how much you're needed, and we appreciate you. But the truth is, many of us are discouraged. It's just the truth. Many of us are emotionally out of energy. <laughs> it's just the truth, too. Many of us have stopped thinking clearly, and many of us have taken our eyes off of where they should be, and we put our eyes only on the circumstances around us. And many of us have listened to the constant negative drum meat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, first of all, let me say a word to you. If you're listening to that negative drum beat 24 7, stop it. I've said it already, I'm gonna say it again. Stop it. You need to hear the news. We need to get our news. I'm for that. But pick you a 30-minute or an hour news show where you really get to hear the news honestly. And then turn it off. Don't hear 18 different people complaining about the same thing 18 different times a day. You were not made for that. Listen to the truth. Get, I'm not saying don't get the news. Get the news. Get the truth. We need the truth. But when you got it, don't keep rehearsing it over and over and over and over again. Next thing I'd say is get plenty of sleep and take care of your body. Some of us are emotionally tired because we haven't done that. By the way, that's what Elijah needed, and that's what God did for Elijah, if you keep reading the story. Discouragement usually sets in, listen to this, when people or circumstances don't meet our expectations. Discouragement sets in when people or circumstances don't meet our expectations. Listen to Job chapter 30. He says, when I expected good, then evil came. When I waited for light, then darkness came. I am seething within and cannot relax. Days of affliction to confront me. I go about mourning without comfort. I is there anything we can do about being discouraged? Now, now let me help you with this for a second. Maybe I'm preaching to myself here. But if you're discouraged about all the cultural issues going on today, your man winning the election next week is not going to take care of your discouragement. I don't care who you're voting for, who you're pulling for. By the way, I know most of in this room, most of us have already voted. A person's not going to take your discouragement away. It's not going to happen that way. It may give you a quick fix, but it's not the answer to discouragement. Sometimes God chooses to remove our disappointments. But God is so powerful. God works in our lives and blesses us in spite of 
our disappointments. He can overcome all the anguish this world throws at us because he is God. Listen, Jesus put it this way, John 16, 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Will you hear that again? Listen, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. See, there's the answer. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Preaching to myself, we don't need life to be easier. What we need is the presence of God in our lives and in our country. That's what we need. Isaiah 41, don't be afraid for I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Romans 5 tells us about the hope that knowing Christ brings. Listen, and this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. And then in chapter 15 of Romans, he says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, here's the message in one sentence. The remedy for discouragement is hope. Real hope. Biblical hope. Now, what is that? Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is not just having a positive attitude about the future. That's not what biblical hope is. Let me define it. Biblical hope is life-shaping certainty about the future. It's life-shaping certainty about the future. Let me say it another way, and this will be on the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. Hope is being so sure of what the future holds that it shapes how you live in the present. Hope is being so sure of what's coming down the pike, so sure of what God says in his word, that it shapes how you live, what you decide about today. That's biblical hope. My favorite passage on hope in all of Scripture is in Hebrews chapter 6. There are certain things when I'm dead and gone, I pray that our church family will have etched in their brain. And, and when, if you think of my name when I'm gone, I'm dead and gone, whenever God chooses to do that, I hope some of these things still resonate in your mind so much you can't get them out of your mind. This is one of those passages. This is the passage I share with my family at my mom's memorial service. This is the passage I used last week at the service of someone very close to Josie and I and her family. The writer of Hebrews says that when God gave Abraham the promise, he said, since God could swear by no one greater than himself, he swore by himself that he would bless Abraham. Hebrews 6, 16, for men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. What does that mean? Men swear by one greater than themselves, and it puts the end of the dispute. It means like you go into the court of law, and you put your hand in a Bible, and you say, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. You're swearing by someone greater than yourself, and what you should not, cannot lie. But there's no one greater than God for him to swear by. Because there's no one greater than God. So God swore by, his, by himself. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath. So God desired to show the heirs of the promise. That's us too, if we've trusted in Jesus Christ. To, he, to show the unchangeableness of his purpose that through Abraham all the world would be blessed. The seed of Abraham, the Messiah, would come Jesus. And that through Jesus the world would be blessed. Verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. So that by two unchangeable things, what are those things? His word. God has given us his word and his oath. 
just in case we didn't get it, just in case we needed a little more, God says, I've given you my word and I've given you my oath. And Scripture teaches plainly that God cannot lie. And who's this for? He says, for those who have taken refuge. If you have taken refuge in Jesus Christ, you've placed your faith in him and received him, this is for you. So that we have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope is certain. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. When you're in a boat, and you need to secure the boat, sea's getting rough, the boat's being tossed about. You have an anchor and you toss it over. Well, if you haven't tied the anchor to the boat, what happens? <laughs> it's just gone, and it's not gonna be any good. And so you tie the anchor to the boat, and then the anchor has to go somewhere the boat can't go, where it catches on something, whether it's the bottom or whatever, and it holds, and then no matter how rough it gets, no matter what happens, the boat holds because the anchor's holding there, and it's tied to the boat. That's the picture. This hope is tied to you, to your soul. This hope we have is an anchor for the soul. It's tied to your soul how? Because if, it's not, if the anchor is not tied to you, how's it going to help you? It's tied to you, and you know it's tied to you because the first knot is God's word. I've given you my word. I've got you. And I've given you my oath. I've got you. This anchor of your soul is tied to you by God's word and by God's oath. He's got you. Do you see that? But the anchor's got to go somewhere, and it has to be firm and fixed. So when life gets hard and we get tossed about, that anchor's going to hold. Where does that anchor go? Where does your anchor go? Where does my anchor go? The scripture says, a hope that enters within the veil. Hebrews talks about Jesus, our great high priest, who passed through the heavens to the right hand of God, far above all rule and authority. He is the anchor of our souls. And that's really good news. So what does that mean? It means when the world's coming apart. It means when our country seems to be disintegrating just in a matter of weeks. And things are coming apart and there is no truth and there's no hope to be found anywhere in culture. God says, I have tied you with my word and my oath and I've got you and your anchor has gone through to the veil into heaven and Jesus is the anchor of your soul. And he says to you and me and the culture, stop looking at the circumstances and understand that I am your hope. And you reach out and you grab onto this hope and you hang on for all you've got to the hope set before you. And you hold on and you hold on and you hold on and the Jesus who promised us in this world you will have trouble. He says you keep holding on. But the good news is when life gets so bad and so hard and so difficult, which it may well for all of us, and you hold on, but when you can't hold on anymore, he says, I want you to know something. I've got you. I have tied you with my word and with my oath, and I will not let you go, period. I've got you. And when that happens, we have this hope as the anchor for our souls, both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil. I think God says to us today, you need to get your eyes off the circumstances and remember where your hope really is. It's in me. It's not in politics. It's not in the media. It's not in anything of this world. He says, it's in me. And we're probably going to be tested maybe more than any of us ever dreamed we would. But no matter what, he says, I've got you. You keep holding on, but I've got you.